let's get started. So my name is Ken, um, and this is Brett, and what we want to do is to spend a little time with you to uh, talk about um, our Maps Your Business, a guide for using our enterprise products. Um, we're part of the, well at least I am, part of a group at Google called Maps for Business. And at Maps for Business we do a number of things beyond building out um, the Google Maps APIs that, that you would know, most likely be familiar with. We also offer premium licenses for those APIs. So for instance, if you um, need SLA or premium support, you can buy that from us, as well as we offer licenses for a number of the use cases that are currently prohibited by the terms of use, such as asset tracking or charging for your application. So we have a number of customers who, who have these kinds of maps for business or enterprise agreements with us, and, and actually a couple of the ones in the sandbox, Nintendo and Mercedes, are these kinds of customers. Uh, we also offer um, products like Earth Enterprise and Maps Engine Portable, which Sean just talked about in the earlier session. And then we also offer a number of products about, that are focused on managing uh, geographic data. And those are the products that we're going to talk about in this session now. So just in case you've fallen asleep because you're attending a talk about enterprise, I thought I would talk about a couple of things why this actually might be relevant to you and why enterprise doesn't need to be boring. And, and the first assertion I'm going to make is that a startup is an enterprise. And the enterprise term gets bandied around as being, I think, often associated with big established companies. But, but a small company that isn't established yet is just an enterprise that hasn't reached its hockey stick moment. Um, and the second is that, especially true, I think, if you're here at this conference, is that your enterprise has location data of some form. You know, bricks and mortar companies have databases of customer addresses, which using a geocoder you can turn into location data. But if you're here at this conference, at a tech conference, or you're a technology company, you're working on mobile in some fashion. You've seen that's been one of the major themes of this conference. Um, and nothing else based on the attendance at the Android sessions with lineups outside the door. And this location data in a mobile world tends to come from the mobile devices that are distributed around, whether your application is on it or your workers are using them. Um, they're generating information about the location of things at a very rapid rate, and that's a different kind of data than we're used to managing in terms of location. And then the last point, which you know, should be obvious, but the Maps API doesn't manage data. The Maps API is on a million different websites, um, and all of those different websites, for the most part, are managing their own data in some fashion. Now, if you're dealing with you know, databases of addresses, which was the original Maps API mashup kind of data, that can often be stored in an SQL database, and you use a bounding box query to populate your map, and you, you know, naively would get a map like this. But when you move into a more mobile world, you get a different kind of data that's much more complicated and comes in at much higher volume. And so you need to have a solution for that data. So what we're going to talk about are three different uh, enterprise products that we offer as part of the Maps for Business group at Google. And the first is Google Maps Coordinate. And Google Maps Coordinate is a product re released last year, which is an out-of-the-box application. This is not actually an API product per se. This is a ready-to-use product that involves uh, mobile apps for Android and iOS, as well as a dispatcher dashboard for the web. And what it allows you to do is mobile workforce management. So you can dispatch jobs to people who are out on the field um, using the app, and they can check into jobs and um, then send you back information from the from the field. This is, this is live and used by a number of customers around the world, one of which is the San Francisco 49ers here um, in the Bay Area, whose security team and, and the team that manages all of the logistics on the road actually use this to work out you know, picking up players from hotels and picking up equipment and that sort of thing to coordinate themselves. Um, that's why it's called Coordinate. The, the second product we'll talk about is called the Google Maps Tracks API. And this has been mentioned in a couple other sessions, but the Tracks API is a data-oriented API product that is about um, storing, analyzing, and visualizing assets. Um, it uses Google Cloud to, to store that information. Um, these assets could be anything from trucks to people to whales. Uh, whatever you can put a GPS device on, you could use the Google Maps Tracks API. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk a bit about the Google Maps Engine platform uh, which is our more all-purpose Cloud GIS that leverages the power of Google's cloud to store your spatial data um, and provides a number of different services around that. 
as well as an API, which we actually just launched last week and haven't um, been talking about a lot publicly, but we'll, we'll talk a bit about here in this, in this session today. And by the way, um, just to reiterate, we're giving away free trial accounts to Google Maps Engine Platform um, at this conference. So if you just head over to the sandbox, um, there are people there who can sign you up and get you sorted right away um, for a trial account for Maps Engine Platform. Great, so what we're going to do um, and to, to kind of walk you through these products that we're going to discuss is we're going to walk you through different stages of a fictional company, a uh, fictional startup of, of Brett and I's um, called Catwalker. So Brett and I spend a lot of time online being Google employees, and of course that means we watch a lot of videos of cats. So we figure we'll have a startup about walking cats. And we got started on this a couple months ago, and we realized very quickly that it had a core problem. And that's that cats sleep, they don't walk. Um, so we pivoted, like all successful startups before us, and um, now our company is called Dog Walker. And we've done a little more research on Dog Walker. We've worked out there are 500 million dogs on the planet, and dogs do like to walk. So we reckon this one is going to be massively successful. So the first thing we want to do to kind of digitize the, the dog walking space is we're going to go out and hire 10 dog walkers. Um, we're going to just kind of hire them on a contract basis. And we're going to put up a simple web form and where people can fill in their details about um, their dog and when they want it walked. And that web form is going to use the Google uh, Maps coordinate API to create jobs in the dispatch screen. And then we're going to use the coordinate uh, mobile applications that our 10 dog walkers will use to actually manage the jobs and take these dogs for a walk. So at this point, I'm going to flip it over to Brett, who's going to show you a demo. Thank you, Ken. So. Due to the nature of uh, Wi-Fi here at Moscone, I'm going to be showing you a video version of this demo. This demo does actually work. I'm quite happy to show it to you if you come over to the sandbox afterwards. So just to set this up, it's a series of, of videos. The first one uh, is basically going to show you that there's nothing in the coordinate admin API, uh, sorry, coordinate admin interface, so there's no jobs waiting. We'll then go to a separate tab, and, and I'll become Bob. Bob has a need to get his dog Fluffy walked. He'll put in these details, and then we'll come back and see the dispatch of that job to a walker. So there we are. We have no jobs. We've got Bob putting in his name, his uh, dog's name, and importantly, getting the address of this wonderful location here at Moscone auto-completed. And you can see the secondary feedback on the right. He's got a phone number. The phone number also gets handed off to the coordinate uh, mobile application to allow the mobile worker to actually contact Bob directly. And of course, Fluffy loves to run around. Now we go back to the admin interface. The admin interface, you can see there's no jobs and suddenly there is a job. So the first thing we, the dispatcher does is dispatch the job to a worker. Suddenly the mark on the map has changed color. We've now got a job and now we're going to switch across to the mobile uh, dispatcher, the mobile worker's application. So this, in this case, is a, a pretend iPhone. Uh, we're all mobile developers these days. So here we've got waiting for a job. The job comes in. You react to it. You actually look at the job, figure out the details, and go, yes, I will accept this job. And then you walk to the location here at Moscone and go, I have the dog. I've accepted the job. I've checked in. and. Then we're back to the admin interface. What we can see here is the fact that the mark is on the map and it's about to change color, notifying the dispatch center that the, the dog has been picked up. It's a little quick, this one. Okay. So now that we've, we've done that, we've taken Fluffy for a walk around Moscone Center and we're handing Mos uh, Fluffy back to Bob. And so what we need to do on the uh, mobile interface is basically complete the job. This means that we've completed the workflow. There's no more that needs to be done here. And the uh, team back at home base get notified that job is complete and there's no more jobs waiting. So. Thank you. 
So what do we actually see there? We had a, a nice little web form, a um, little bit of information. There were three integrations with Google Maps. The first one was our autocomplete API, which is important. It gets us coordinate information. The second integration was uh, the map on the right-hand side that was showing the user where we thought his address was. This is important for the user to understand that we actually know what, what's going on. And thirdly, the one that the user didn't see was the post back to coordinate to actually get the job in train in the workflow. So looking at the integration, because this is the one call you need to make to us that, that makes it all work. First two are parameters, our client ID, API key. This is all to do with our discovery-based APIs. If you've integrated with any of Google's APIs in the last two years, you probably know these and love these inside out. If you haven't, again, come and hassle me in the sandbox afterwards. I'll quite happily walk you through getting through our discovery API bootstrap and whichever client library you want to use and all that sort of thing. The next one is the coordinate team ID. This is the identifier so we know which team to send the job to to dispatch it. Um, our documentation walks through where to find that. So you make a post back to, to our servers at this address, and you pass us some information. The first important one is the Latin long. This is why integrating with something like autocomplete to get the correct Latin long is very important, because that is the gold. We won't change this. It's where your workers will get sent by their mobile phone. The next chunk of information is all the information around it to give the worker uh, context. So the name of the guy he's going to get the dog from, the action he's carrying out, the phone number that, the, uh, that Bob put in. All of this gets passed off the coordinate here and thus turns up on the mobile phone. And on to stage two. There you can. Perfect. So it's worth noting that uh, Google Maps coordinate is already being used by a number of people around the world outside of the San Francisco 49ers. Um, and we actually sell it like Google Apps on a per user basis. So you don't need to be a massive telco with thousands of workers in order to use it. You can use it with 10 people just, just handily. Uh, so let's move on to stage two of our fictional company. And in stage two, um, we're going to build the marketplace, right? So stage one was all about us running a little local business to walk dogs, essentially. Um, and the second is we actually want to take this Uber style and completely decentralize and take it global, right? So what we want to do is build one mobile application that walkers and owners and dog owners can use to find each other and to organize dog walks. And the desires we have for this mobile application is we want transparency between the walkers and the dog owners. And that means we want real-time dog location. And we want to be able to visualize the walks on a map as they're happening. Right? Um, and in order to do this, we're going to need a data storage solution for the, the crumbs that are coming from the mobile phones. And Google Maps coordinate at this point becomes less ideal because we actually don't want a dispatcher in the center of us. We want this to be decentralized and working more on a peer-to-peer -peer basis between, between the users. So the product that we're going to use is the Google Maps Tracks API. So we can gather crumbs from the mobile phones as they're um, out, as, as the walkers are out walking the dogs. We can push those up to the Google Maps Tracks API. And then on the dog owner side, side we can um, actually send requests to the Tracks API to pull down that information in real time. Do you understand that? So there's a handoff of the data up to the cloud and back down, and the Tracks API will handle all of that for you at scale. Um, so I'll flip it over now to Brett, who's going to walk us through a demo of this piece. Aha, press the right button again. So again, we're going to do a couple of videos here. So we've got two applications. One of them is going to be Android-based. This one is the dog owner. And the other one is iOS-based, and that's going to be the dog walker. So I'm effectively avoiding all the, the, the chrome that you need to put on your app so that people use it, the good copywriting, the wonderful design, because I'm an engineer. I'm just focusing in on the core aspect, which is getting the crumbs up to Tracks API and querying them back down to effectively do near real-time tracking of Fluffy. So, kicking it off. What we have here is Bob playing with an Android tablet, trying to find the keys. We'll also see that we have a different autocomplete, but it is uh, Google Places API, 
to turn around and make sure that the address and the location is correct, please turn around and, and use an API like this that gives the user real-time feedback on what they're typing in. Don't force them to press a button to auto-complete an address. The next thing we see here is uh, Android Maps. It's a, a nice and shiny API, a uh, nice and shiny map look. And let's go across the iOS. So here we've got the dog walker. The dog walker is waiting for dogs, and he gets notified that there's a dog that needs to be walked, clicks on the button, and now, well, I was actually going to take you all down the escalator and around Moscone, but I was figuring due to time constraints that maybe getting you all afternoon exercise in the middle of our talk wasn't the best idea. So we're just uh, pretending to go for a walk around Moscone. And if we were to bring up Bob's uh, machine at the same time, we would see a little bit of lag due to the uh, realities of light travel and all that sort of thing, but do uh, Bob could see his dog, or more importantly, his dog walker, out on the path, so he doesn't have to get worried that the dog walker is just going down to the, the coffee house and drinking three or four lattes before bringing his dog back. So, actually having a look at, uh -huh. having a look at the aforementioned crumbs. Here's the actual information that you push off to our servers. It's actually a fairly simple piece of JSON where you're basically telling us how confident you are of the location uh, which you get from your mobile device. It, it, there are APIs in there to find that out. A location, where you are on the planet, and timestamp is an epoch. You can also add uh, other data that you can then turn around and feed into our other APIs. Great. So it's worth noting uh, that the Tracks API uh, is a, an API that you can pick up and use for free for a, for a limited number of assets and a limited number of tracks. So you don't have to wait or contact our salespeople. Uh, this is a product that has, uh, to, to a certain limited feature set, is free. And then if you want to build something more involved that's going to involve a lot more data, then, then it becomes a paid product. And it was a, an API that we just launched last year. So go play with it. Um, so we want to move down to stage three. Um, and stage three was where we talk about the Google Maps Engine platform. So we're going to assume now that our, our product is launched, our mobile app is out there, um, and we have dogs and walkers happening, um, but we want to grow. In order to do this, we want to find a way to correlate dog parks and in the area with demographic data to try to find where we think there's, there's a hot spot that we might want to go out and do so, you know, some walk around and do some advertising. So what we want to use for this is the Google Maps Engine platform. The Google Maps Engine is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Cloud GIS, and it accepts data in a large number of formats, whether it's shapefile or GeoJSON um, or whatever, you can upload it into Google Maps Engine, you can create layers out of that, and then you can overlay those layers on top of each other in order to create um, an interesting visualization. So that's what we're going to show you now, and we're actually going to flip to a live demo this time because we're not using mobile devices and we can be wired into the network, and Brett's going to walk you through this piece. Okay, so... Little bit of, a little bit of unusual at this uh, stage. We've actually got a live web demo. Now, our theory... Oh, hey, I, are you using Google.maps to visual refresh equals true? I am. Well, Look at this. It's all shiny. It's all new. Sorry. Quick plug. So, here's San Francisco. I'm a Sydney sider, so I don't know it that well. But diving into our data, um, we've, we've come up with a thesis. And our thesis is... Well, we've got a bunch of dog parks, and we're wondering, what does San Francisco look like? So what's the best way to understand a city? Well, that'd be census data. Has anyone here actually played with census data? You'll quickly discover that it comes as a shape file with lots of stuff in it, and oh my god, trying to understand what's in it, it's a bit of a pain. So what you really need is a way to query that data and basically go, Give me, given a set of attributes over a chunk of data, how do I look at it? So, what we can do, and this is a completely custom uh, dashboard that I've built on top of GME API, 
So it's basically firing SQL-like where queries at our servers to actually figure out what's going on. So and that's what you've done before you move into the census bit. That's how you got the markers on the screen. So these are yes. all the dog parks in San Francisco. Yep. Um, Sorry. Thank you, Ken. Yes. Please explain the dog parks to me. Okay. So we've, the dog parks are pulled from SF Rec Park, where we've got a list of dog parks, constructed that as a KML file, and put that into our servers so that we can then turn around and do things like dog parks near a point. At this point, I've just pulled all the dog parks in uh, San Francisco and put them on the map using markers. So uh, using a little wonderful little thing called GeoJSON. So it's really easy to walk through in JavaScript. Right. So diving into uh, our data, we've got a, a theory that there are parts of San Francisco that have a whole lot of you know, 30 to 39 year olds. And what just happened? Zooming out a bit so we can actually see what's going on. Here we've got San Francisco. And suddenly I've overlaid on it the census tract blocks that have a large concentration of 30 to 39 year olds. The interesting thing here is that that was quick, it was painless, and I'm not actually storing any data on my laptop to make this happen. I've fed the shapefile into the GME, and now I'm firing queries against it so that I can look at age, race, and whatever else the census data tells me about it. So you could just change those numbers there, and it would fire off another query, and so you get can. different data back. So to if you were You're not kidding me. 20 to 29-year-olds. Um, then we get a, a different view of San Francisco. Right. So based on this data, where would you recommend I go out on Saturday and hand out flyers? I'm thinking, there's this little cluster of parks here with a whole bunch of middle-aged people. I'm thinking they're probably wrapped up doing startups. I think that's where we should go. Right, so 30 to 39-year-olds living near dog parks. Seems to be a cluster in that area. They're probably the kind of people that have more money than time. So that's where we'll go hand them out. We'll do a tour of those dog parks on the weekend. Yep. Great, fantastic. So, diving into what just happened. Again, it's another discovery-based API, so we've got an API key. The more important part are these IDs. These IDs are actually from GMA. So when you upload a chunk of data and create a vector table, it will turn around and give you an asset ID. With this asset ID, you can then turn around and query against uh, GMA. So there's a couple of queries that I've got here. The first one was the dog park URL. So this one is the, the markers. We're just requesting a straight dump of those markers and turning around and walking through them and putting them on the screen as, as uh, points on the screen. Just a quick question before yep. you go on here. I'm a product guy, so I have an idea, which is I would love to show all of those dog parks in the mobile app so that the walkers know where a dog-friendly park is to go walk their dog. Is that possible? Could I use the same thing to do that? Absolutely. This is a uh, question. <laughs> well, not really. You didn't <laughs> practice it before. <laughs> I like it written down in triplicate. OK, so yes, you can make these queries through mobiles. You can do things like points near. So you can turn around and go, as a mobile app, I'm currently at this location. Tell me the dog parks that are close to me and have GME API do the distance calculations for you. And it'd be a similar kind of integration. Just pointing out that this is just a straight Ajax call. There's no magic here. The more interesting query from my point of view, uh, and this is kind of new for us as, as a company, I mean, not for GMA, we have the ability to do SQL-like where queries against our data, which means we can turn around and filter based on the attributes of the points or paths or um, parcels of land in this case. So what we're doing here is the query uh, interface builder that you saw at the top left of my screen before is being used to create SQL-like queries and go, show me a chunk of San Francisco where this value is between two known points. And right. So I can upload a data that has all sorts of different kinds of metadata in it to Google Maps Engine, like a whole different series of essentially yep. column names. Yep. And then I can run like greater than, less than, other kinds of 
binary queries yep. via so, the API on yep. that data, my custom data. It's not restricted to. Absolutely. Like the good old days, really. Proper database. All right. So um, just a few conclusions and parting thoughts, because that ends our demo of Google Maps Engine. The first is that uh, you always need more than a Maps API. You always did. Uh, any mashup that's been built um, has always had to have some sort of back end, whether or not it was a simple kind of you know, file stored on your server that you pulled in, um, or it was something more complex like an SQL database that you're trying to run queries on, or you're using PostGIS, or you're using something of that form. You always need more than a Maps API when you're building an application to do with location. Um, and the second is plan for a large amount of location data, especially if you're working in the mobile space. Uh, these phones <laughs> and devices that, that are out there, even if it's not a phone, even if it's just like a dedicated GPS, cheap GPS device, it's going to be generating a lot, of, a lot of crumbs. And those crumbs are actually at high volume and, and take a bit of effort to store. So even if you're a small organization, you should probably plan from the beginning, just because of the volume of this, to scale. And so think about that when you're designing your product. And last is, we have some questions now, um, but stick around for the fireside chat that we're having after this session with the larger portion of the Google Maps API team. We'll be happy to answer all sorts of questions. Thank you. I if you could use the mic, please. The talk is being recorded, that's why. We could hear you, but the people online watching later on YouTube won't be able to hear you. All right, uh, my name is Hong Xing. I have a question regarding the, the user data. So right now, the user data can only be in JSON format. Is there any way for you to actually accept the binary user data, like a specific point I have a special image assigned for you know, that dog, for example? Are you speaking about the Google Maps Engine platform or Tracks API right. or specific? Like a Maps Engine platform, like, a, like your, you know, your dog walker uh, you know, program. Yeah. You know, like a, an owner wants to actually you know, send the image of uh. the dog. Yeah, so that's a very good question. We don't have at the moment support for images. Um, you could potentially. Um, store the image elsewhere and then send a link to the image and then store the link to the image as a bit of, a bit of text, right? So that, that might be a way to get around it. But we're not in, our, um, in our, our products here to store the location data. We don't have the ability at the moment to store large volumes of binary data alongside it. All right, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, by the way, very impressed with the new version of Maps. Uh, it's some good things, but some bad things. And uh, I'll give you conjecture on the side. But one thing from a developer's perspective, we can't use the new Maps API yet. It's, we're still using the old versions of it. And uh, so my question is more fundamental. We can take KML data and actually just insert it to Google Maps and have it displayed on googlemaps.com. Yeah. Or we can do these APIs and have our own site. So you know, KML is one segue to getting data onto Google Maps. And there may be other ways. I'm not sure. I haven't evaluated them. But more, my question is more fundamental. Are you encouraging uh, you know, mid-level developers, not high-level development companies? We're a marketing company, as you might tell. Uh, well, would you encourage us to continue to do our own Maps deployments on our own servers and our own websites and our own Maps apps on our Android phones, or to leverage things like KML and going into Maps.com? So um, I think there are a couple angles to this question. The first is KML is a, is a data exchange format yeah. that, that's a standard and is supported by um, at least Google Maps Engine. Tracks API is about crumbs, so it's not dealing with KML files specifically. Um, and so that's generally supported in our API products. Now, whether or not you want to store the data yourself on your own servers or use our cloud storage um, platforms yeah, to store that question. data, I think is, is a separate question and, and yeah. is related to your business. Um, but I think KML as the exchange format is really about how you communicate, whether you're communicating with your own server or you're communicating with our server. Sure. Um, you can then use KML to, 
to but, but I guess my point is the control of the design. map is a lot more precise when I have it on my own website, whereas if I put my data as KML to Google, I don't have the full extent of Maps API at my hands. Right, okay, okay. So I think, in that case, I think we're talking about a different question, which is if you want to visualize your KML file, um, you can potentially upload it to what was my maps, was my maps, and view it in maps.google.com. Right. Um, that's designed uh, generally for consumers. So a regular person who got a KML file from somewhere and wants to just visualize it, um, they can potentially do that. Um, okay. There's a different question around building, building Last question websites. then, real quick. Yeah. Um, the, uh, my Maps, which is the next logical question, yeah. available in the new preview, in the new Maps version uh, that's uh, you know, being uh, demo previewed right now, or you, or you know if they're going to be extending so my, that? My Maps is, is currently only available in the in older the version of Google right. Maps. Um, and, and I can't stand here and speak for their gotcha. roadmap, or I get in trouble when I, gotcha. when I leave right. the room. Thank you much. Sorry. I understand the direction. <laughs> yep. Come and hassle us in the uh, sandbox afterwards if you've got any questions. Ask the, at the microphone. Oh, sorry. Wait, you want me to ask? Sure. Oh. The question was, uh, the teams with the new design, that doing the new preview design for Google Maps and the Google Maps API team, yeah. has, this, has, has the new version of Google Maps been preview been done mostly as a back end or more on a front end development? It appears to me it's more of a front end development versus the engine in the back end. There may be some visual effects of like expanding the streets on the route that you're taking, but I think those are just mathematical offsets that could have been done on either front. So, um, so we're all part of the larger geo group at Google, right? Um, the, Google, the new Google Maps is a rebuild of Google Maps from the bottom up. So they're storing the data differently all the way from, from the lowest levels to the way th they're visualizing it. Um, we're, on the Maps API, we typically um, leverage the pieces that are built for the consumer applications. Mm -hmm. and, and we're currently, at the moment, leveraging the pieces that were built for the existing Google Maps, not the preview, which is why the API that we have um, is still working on, on image-based maps sure. um, rather, than, rather than the WebGL-based right. maps that you see in the new Google Maps. Yeah. Well, if I could put conjecture about that design, uh, even though it wasn't the point of the session, but uh, one of the things that you get as a benefit of using the API is that you can implement those sort of design features of the slider and the carousel versus a list view. Uh, personally, I prefer a list view for when I'm searching for businesses and I don't know which one I want. But uh, I can see how the map interface might work for some users, but it's just kind of a difference between you know, classic mode versus Windows 8. Thank you for that image. It's breaking my head. There's a little time, so I'll ask a question, too. Yep. Um, it was thought of it based on another question that was asked about photos. So I know that right now it's not supported to upload large binary files in Maps Engine. Yep. But let's say I just want to upload them to another service that Google offers, um, either photo or video, maybe from the YouTube API or something. Yep. Can I spatially tag those and then somehow pull them into a you know, reference in a Google Map? Uh, so are you talking about sp specifically building your own application that would include video or photos that would say location tag? Yeah, so I, I was trying to answer it in, in the last question, which is that I think you would, you would have to separate the storage of the binary data from the linking of it in the storage of your location data. So if you first step took your image and pushed it to one of our, our cloud storage options for images, say Drive, right? Um, and as a public image, you could then grab the URL and store that as metadata in the Tracks API so that when you pulled down that information, you, would, you could link them together. But remember that the Tracks API is designed for crumbs, right? So it actually probably, as I'm talking through this, it doesn't make sense for you to store images against crumbs unless you're snapping an image every time something moves, which mm -hmm. is, might not be the case, right? If you're doing that, then you want to do it. Otherwise, you could yourself, because this, this is just a back-end component of the application you're building, you would have, you're going to have a database of assets yourself that you know of, right? Your whales. You've got your list of 20 whales, and you have photos of them, and you can store that in your own back-end, and you just need to relate your asset ID in the Tracks API. So you pass your own asset ID to the Tracks API when you store the crumbs. 
So the access control list that you'd use to, to kind of control access to who can see this data, can you also apply those to the photos and videos and, and other Google service? So in the Tracks API, um, it's your application has access to all of the data that it's stored in the Tracks API, right? So it's not a, a user level access control function. It's, it's more of a back end piece. So you could control, if you have multiple users of your application, you could control which tracks they're allowed to view based on the fact that you have an interface that sits in between them. Mm -hmm. right? For Maps Engine, though, because that's uh, a right. little different. So Maps Engine, right. Maps Engine is a different product, and Maps Engine is designed, we, we have an API that lets you store the data and pull it down. We also, that's a good question, uh, Maps Engine allows you to set who has access to your data that you've stored in the cloud and to work together in teams. So you both, can both from viewing and editing, they're separate ICLs. Right, right. So but those, those uh, ACLs are generally designed for you in your own organization and you're in your own team, rather than setting a different ACL on every one of your end users, potentially, who would be using the data that you're serving out of it, if that makes sense. I think so. Right? So yep. if we're in dog walker, Brett and I could give each other access to the data, but maybe not give it to our finance guy because he'll muck with it. Right? But, but the end users who are walking their dogs, we would control how they get the data based on the interface that we build in between. OK, yeah. thank you. All right, well, let's wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you.